Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. And I am joined today from one of our guests over in LA. It is uh, the Amani Roberts, who is not only a professional professional DJ, he's a speaker, an author, and a professor, which is actually quite an unusual mix. So I'm really keen to hear a little bit more about how you got to be those four things particularly. Um, we've just been having a wee bit of a chat, and we were talking about um, today on the podcast about unlocking creativity. So how do we as business owners kind of unlock creativity? So welcome to the show, Amani. Lovely to have you here. Thank you very much, Deborah, for having me me. I'm excited to talk to you. Um, thanks again. Oh, my absolute pleasure. So tell us a wee bit about, because that is really, I think probably one of the most unusual combinations I've had on my show, if I'm really honest, DJ, speaker, author, and professor. Yes. <laughs> tell us a little bit about your story and, and where you are now and how you got there. Absolutely. I grew up um, on the East Coast of the United States, so the Washington, D.C. area, went to Howard University, um, I grew up wanting to be a DJ, but I didn't think it would be a legitimate career. Um, I was wrong. So I went to school, worked across different hotels across the country. And then I arrived in Los Angeles and I decided to learn how to DJ. And so I made the transition slowly and eventually went full time DJing. But as you know, as we know now, it's very hard to be full time um, a DJ when you're starting off. You know, you need to have some different revenue streams to kind of support you as you grow your business, grow your network, things like that. Um, so what happened is that I was DJing, doing a little writing, and then I got the opportunity through networking to uh, be a professor at a local university. And they approached me and they gave me two classes and like a week to get prepared. An adjunct professor, I go in, I do well. The first semester was very challenging. I do well the first semester. They asked me back and I've just kind of continued to stay back in the interim. While I was teaching, I did get my master's degree so I could stay teaching. And now I kind of blend all four together. It's all pretty much based about the music business. I teach music business. I teach entertainment operations. That's kind of what I speak about in terms of creativity. And that's what I do in terms of DJ. So that's kind of a quick synopsis of how <laughs> yep. I got to be a DJ, a professor and a speaker. Um, and that's kind of where I'm living right now. That's fantastic. It's great to see that you're kind of, you know, doing what you love, which is one of my um, things that I always advocate for is life's too short to not be doing what you love. Um, so, so you're a full-time DJ now though. So, I mean, that, that actually has become a profession and. Yes, yes. It's a profession. Um, and, you know, I've gone from doing a lot of work in like clubs and bars. I do some social events like weddings. I primarily do corporate events now, so you can space mm -hmm. them out a little bit. Um, you know, I also do like a lot of hosting and emceeing, which is how I learned how to do that through DJing. Um, so I kind of combine them all and it really makes for a good living. There's always room to grow. I can always do more gigs. I just try to be as selective as possible so I can be focused, but mm -hmm. it's continuing to evolve. It's, it's doing well. It hasn't been easy. It's been a long road, but I'm here now and we take it day by day. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because I always talk to my guests and, and particularly when they're business owners, it's like we have this this vision of we'll start a business, we'll have a few, you know, little um, problems in the beginning, but then it will just be a beautiful S-curve, it will be smooth sailing, everything's going to be great. That's what they teach us in business school, yeah, that classic S-curve. Life's not quite like that, is it? No, no the life and growing a business is not linear is what I like to say. It's not linear. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. So what are some of the challenges that you've kind of faced along the way? I think the primary challenge is that, you know, when you're creative, your income could be very volatile, meaning you mm -hmm. could have a very, very busy first quarter. Your third quarter could be very slow. Sometimes it's hard to predict and you just really have to build upon your business and you can't be kind of so focused. Like that's why I DJ. I also MC. I do some speaking and then I do some kind of coaching as well because you need to have the different income streams. You know, God forbid we have another pandemic, but when we did have the pandemic, 
you know, there were no events going on. So you had to shift to do maybe some online events. I was fortunate that I was teaching. So that was allowed me to get some revenue and benefits. So I think that's probably the biggest lesson is that you're supposed to go all in, but within your career that you're going all in with, make sure you have some different revenue streams that derive from there. And I think mm -hmm. that's the lesson that I learned. It took me a, a minute to learn that, but I strongly believe in that. And I feel that that's the proper way to move forward as, you know, the world continues to evolve. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the old adage of not, not having all your eggs in one basket and it applies to business too. It's not that we want to be everything to everybody, but if you can actually be really clearly defined about what your niche is and, and have different, um, different customers, different revenue streams, different ways of actually delivering that, I think that's really important. Yes, I agree. A hundred percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So unlocking creativity, you do a lot of talking around this and I'm not even really quite sure what it means. So why don't you give us a little bit of an explanation and what you mean by that? Absolutely. Um, and that's good that you say that because, you know, unlocking creativity sounds could be kind of random, kind of big to people, but many times in business and in life, we get stuck. We could hit a plateau with our career. We could hit, you know, in terms of creating new ideas, you could hit, um, kind of get stuck, run up against the wall. So I talk to people about just how to get unstuck, how to become more creative, unlock your creativity. I come from uh, Julia Cameron, and she has this book called The Artist's Way, which I'm sure you probably have heard of. We use a lot of exercises in that book, really going back to when you are a child and making sure you're doing some of the things you love to do, whether it be going for walks, playing video games, you know, going to museums, but building that into your routine and your daily life. Um, and that will help you like unlock your creativity. In addition, there are skills like journaling, which we call it like morning pages in, in the book, you know, artist dates. Mm -hmm. So I take some of the concepts from that book. We talk about that activities. And then I also combine how to do that by using music. Music is one thing that can really help uh, whether or not you're trying to create ideas and you put on some you know, classical music or you know you have different genres that you love. It could be Afrobeats, hip hop, country. Um, but I combine- Especially if you're doing housework. I think there's uh, a certain type of music that really encourages well, housework. Yeah, house music. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I try to tie that into like more professionally, like just different techniques that you can use to unlock your creativity, how you get inspiration and how you can unlock it so that you can move forward and become better at what you're doing. You can overcome any obstacles you may have in creating things. And that's one of the topics that um, I talk about and it and people really love it. And it's really different from what they're used to. Hmm. It's actually really interesting because we do talk with our businesses that I work with around, you know, you get to this point where you do hit the ceiling and that can be at a company level, department level, individual level, but you just feel stuck. That's what hitting the ceiling means, right? You, you feel stuck. You're not quite sure. Um, you've kind of plateaued and you just don't know how to get out of that funk. Um, and so what you're talking about is, is a way to actually unlock the creativity to get you past that stuckness. Is that right? Yes. You just define where you're stuck and then tap into experiences that you've had in the past that can help you come up with different ideas to get around it. We're probably our most creative as humans when we're kids because we don't, mm. we, we haven't been told or we haven't experienced how an idea might work or we haven't been told as many times as we have been as an adult. So if we can tap into that kind of fearlessness and really, really kind of work on just thinking about any and every idea that you could have to, to solve a problem, to create a new product, to, to you know, maybe relaunched a product that you've that's been successful but is kind of getting stale um that would be beneficial but you know as adults we've heard no so many times we kind of rule out ideas or tactics before we even try it and so that's really the main goal is to tap into our zeal and enthusiasm from when we were children and apply that to our current day issues and ideas I love that. I know that when you go skiing and you watch young kids on ski slopes, right, that they've obviously never been told that they can't do it. And they just look at other adults doing it and going, well, if they can do it, I can. And they just get on with it. And as adults, we've suddenly got all this stuff that's been sort of, you know, forced into us. You ought to, you should, all these expectations mm -hmm. yeah. and all this fear of well, what happens if I fall over and break my leg or whatever. And, and I just love, I love watching children on the slope because they just, mm -hmm. they have this absolute, um, zero fear and just it's literally they go if that person is doing it why can't i <laughs> exactly it's true yeah. and so we should apply that same philosophy to a current day not just when we're kids
Mm. But sometimes it can be really hard, right? Because we all have bad days. We all have bad weeks. I mean, to be perfectly frank, we've had a couple of bad months and, you know, you get into that whole, I call it the spiral of doom where it's just, you, 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 if you're not careful, you will hit rock bottom. And it's like, well, how do you actually pull yourself out of that? What yeah. would you suggest are the first steps to kind of start to, well, first of all, you have to recognize it. But once you've recognized it, what can you do to kind of pull yourself out? Yeah, I think there's a couple things that are very, very um, productive that we can do. First, we have to identify the fears because fear is probably what, what really holds us back the most. Fear of mm -hmm. failure, sometimes fear of success, fear of running out yep. of time. So once you can identify the fear and then understand that it's always going to be there, but we still need to try to move forward despite it and just see what happens. I think a couple specific activities that really help is like I mentioned before, like journaling, especially when you're like a rock bottom journaling, particularly if you could write letters to yourself where you are today and then write a letter to where you could be in six months or a year. So writing a letter to your future self, I think is yeah. very effective, very powerful, helps you get it out there. Um, I also think that doing a lot of like visual activities. Nowadays, we don't really get magazines as much anymore, but, you know, vision boards and things like that, mm -hmm. you can use Pinterest to do that. I think that's very, very effective. Um, I also think that to be very, very cognizant of who you're spending the most time with, um, you know, the, the old saying, you know, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. That is a fact. That is very true. So make yes. sure you're surrounding yourself uh, with positive people. Another saying, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you need a new room. I agree with that 100 percent, too. Um, yeah. So really try to get out there, meet people, attend events that, you know, could be beneficial where you can find people that are on your kind of vibration level. For example, yeah. I just went to the National Speakers Association annual conference in Orlando. And it was tremendous because there's so many other people there that were on just the same higher level. So you got to talk, listen. Um so do things like that, even watch like uplifting, motivating podcasts, interviews, just really because there's so much negativity out there now. So you really have to try to stay away from that. Don't watch the news and just kind of continue to fill yourself up with some positive food, with a helpful information that will increase. Read books. I know I think I read a stat. I should have written it down. But I think the stat I read was like, you know, 80% of the people in the world will not even read one book in a year, which is shocking, oh, really? but I'm not surprised because <laughs> if you want to, you want to keep a secret, put it in a book. So read a lot of books, listen, observe. Those are things that I would advise for people who have kind of hit a uh, rock bottom. But the hidden trick I want to say is to write those letters to your current self and your mm -hmm. future self. I think that's just incredibly impactful. I think that's actually, I was going to ask, we're going to go back to that and actually ask you about that because I know that I did Outward Bound. I'm not sure if you have that in America, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a course that really kind of challenges a lot of your thinking, sort of physically, emotionally, the whole thing. And we have three days of solitary confinement, I suppose it almost feels like, where you're in a tent on your own, you get given very, very small rations of food, and you're not allowed to take anything with you apart from a journal. And you have to actually write a letter to your future self in six months' time, and they give you some questions to ponder so that you can actually write that in the letter and then they hold on to that letter and they post it to you six months later and it was a really pivotal point for me because I was going through some difficult things in a personal relationship and I wrote down all the things that I'd learned about myself being outward bound and, and the things I was actually capable of doing that I thought I couldn't do like running 12 kilometers I'm not built mm -hmm. to run but we man we know we managed to run 12 kilometers I managed to climb rock faces I thought I'd never be able to do and so when that letter arrived in the mail six months later it was just my mind-blowing because my life had actually changed quite significantly in that six months mm -hmm. um, and this letter to myself was just a reinforcement of yes I've made the right decision yes I'm doing the right thing so and all the things I talked about in my letter to myself had actually come true so there's a real power isn't there in writing mm -hmm. that stuff down yeah, yeah. I do a similar activity with my students um, I think it's probably a five or ten year letter just because I want them to be wow. kind of uh, out in the professional world for a while, but they're supposed to, you know, describe everything from where they live, their daily routine, what kind of job they have, how their personal life is. And then, yeah. you know, hopefully soon as I get to maybe seven or eight years of my students graduating after doing that activity, you know, they'll get the letters, they'll look at them again, but it's extremely powerful. It's kind of like a hidden treasure and most yeah. people don't really do it. So the fact that you've done it and experienced it is, is good because it's very effective and I encourage people to continue to do it.
Matter of fact, I need to sit down and write myself a letter to me in a year also. So you're reminding me. Well, right I think I'm, I'm, due, I'm due for I'm due for one as well. Actually, it's really interesting. And I think sometimes people struggle and they go, "Where do I start?" And I actually was talking to somebody on the podcast the other week who was an AI kind of expert, and he said, "You know, Chat GPT, yeah, it's got its uses, but one of the things you actually can do is you can actually get it to help you start writing that. So mm-hmm. you can say to it, you know, what's important to you, what you're looking for, and it will put together a draft for you. And then you can obviously, you know, don't take anything as as gospel." from chat GPT but it gives no. you a framework yeah. and then you can start you know working on it building it and then suddenly you've got that letter to yourself in, in 10 years time so yeah. um, use technology to, to assist you not to not to do, not to do the writing but, but you know do the mm. research and help you with the prompts and things because yeah. the letter has got to come from you from within yeah yeah, absolutely. So so the other thing you mentioned was journaling. And this is something that um, I know has been recommended by a lot of people that I've, it's something I actually don't do. And it's something that I'm not really even sure. I always get, I do clarity breaks. So we sit there with a blank piece of paper and just ask ourselves some questions and write things down. But journaling is a little bit different. What, how, how do you describe journaling and how does one start journaling? So there's a couple, um, there's two different techniques that I'll describe to you that I use both. The first mm-hmm. one is that as soon as you wake up in the morning, you know, get your journal and just write down any ideas that have come across your consciousness the night before. So write down mm-hmm. any idea. Try to get 10 or 11 ideas a day, no matter how daring, how creative, how unlikely they are to be good ideas. Write them all down every day, because once we wake up is kind of when our mind is at the clearest. And yeah. so that's the first part. Then... Um, it's kind of taken more from like the morning pages or just like when you are so inspired, it could be after you finish work, before you cook dinner, after dinner, before you go to bed, then you can kind of write down things about your day, how you're feeling, what happened, what are you looking forward to, what didn't go well. Maybe if you're having, you know, conversations or you're not able to have conversations with people maybe in your personal life, but you want to get some things out that you're feeling, just write those down. Um, Lists, lists are always a good thing. Um, You can write, you know, when it comes to maybe a job that you're looking at taking or a client, all the positives, all the negatives. If you're working or you have a significant other, you can write about all the characteristics you like about them, maybe some things you don't like about them. So you can use it for personal and professional. Um, The key is just to get it out of your mind and your heart and your soul and onto the paper. Mm -hmm. And so the ideas in the morning, you can also do the writing and the feelings during the day, in the morning, evening. Those are the two types of journaling that um, I recommend. I personally need to do more of it because I'm particularly overdue. Um, Even if you're on traveling, you're on a plane, sometimes you're on a plane, you're sitting there waiting for takeoff. That's a perfect time to write because you can't really do anything else but that. (laughs) Um, And I just think that it's very effective and it can really help. Yeah. So I think maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I'm overcomplicating it, which I think we tend to do as humans, right? Because I'm actually, I am doing some, I'm do, doing my gratitude each day and talking about the things I'm excited about in the next day. And I do try and get everything out of my head before I go to bed, because I know that if I don't, I'll wake up at 2 or 3 a.m. and suddenly my mind yeah. is full of all kinds of things. Yeah. But I think that the it, it's the free, fo- the, the lists thing, because I, I love making lists. I'm mm-hmm. half German, so for me, oh, lists, <laughs> lists are, are, are a, a thing I love to do. But I like the idea of, you know, just, um, it's a really good chance just to get stuff out of your head and to when it's in writing there's something about it isn't it it's like you've actually you've got something you can refer to it sort of brings clarity to what you're thinking about as opposed to just keeping it in your head or um and I love so I actually um, I use a remarkable rather than a pen and paper mm. um and I bought this little um, stylus which looks like a pencil which I quite mm-hmm. like because it makes me feel like I'm a kid back at school yeah. kind of writing in my journal um, but I do find that you know we do spend a lot of time typing and doing communications using typing but actually writing has a different I don't know it has a different connection to the brain doesn't it I believe it does um I have a remarkable too by the way I like to use it also oh, yeah. um and just writing things out I just think it sticks more to keep it as simple as possible it just kind of sticks more than typing is a little bit mm-hmm. um it doesn't stick as much when it comes to typing no, also with I think lists. there was some research done because I'm sure as a professor, I know when I was at university, I'm pretty certain we were kind of shown that actually people who type notes in lectures and things have got a less chance mm-hmm. of actually re- recalling it than if I you physically write it. Write it. Yeah. yeah, I would believe that. And another list you can do, which I, f- I really promote doing monthly, if not every quarter, is just write mm-hmm. a list down of all your accomplishments, all the accomplishments that you've made, you know, in your whole career. 
and you keep writing the yep. list and you'll see that different ones will pop up at different times as you've made and, you know, done some things the past month or quarter that will also come on the list. I think that that's, that's a tremendous thing that you can do. And then you can actually post it around your office, wherever you're working. So you're consistently reminded of it. And, and mm-hmm. if you happen to go back to, you know, the example where maybe you're kind of spiraling down, you know, a place where you're hitting rock bottom, but that list can help get you out of there quicker. So a list of accomplishments is also something I would add to the list that you're writing. Yeah, that's it's really interesting. When I um, used to do a lot of personal leadership coaching, we had people who were stuck. We would actually make them write down a hundred things that they were proud of, mm-hmm. and it it couldn't just be very generic things like "I'm a great mum." No, that's not good enough. You have to be specific about what makes you a great mum or what it is. And it's actually really hard. Like a hundred things to write about yourself mm-hmm. is really really challenging. But when you do it, you suddenly realise, wow, you know, there's actually a lot of things that I've managed to do in in my life that. I should be really proud of. (laughs) Yes, yes. One of the things in terms of unlocking creativity that we focus on is uh, getting through imposter syndrome. And the task Mm -hmm. that you just described in terms of writing down all your accomplishments where you are today, is one of the main kind of activities and ideas that we we have our our students participate in, in terms of getting through imposter syndrome, because imposter syndrome really, really holds people back. But if they can look and say, For example, if you're trying to write a book and they Mm -hmm. write down all of the things that they've studied in school, maybe they've gotten good grades, the articles they've written, the panels they've spoken on, the different podcast interviews they've done, just all these different things that they've been a part of, the committees they're a part of at work or maybe with, you know, professional, personal associations, they look up, they're like, well, I see now why I could actually be more than qualified to do this one thing that I feel I'm an imposter with. So the list, the accomplishments, getting and unlocking creativity, one of the main things, which I forgot to mention, but this is a good reminder, is just getting past imposter syndrome because that holds us back so much. Right. And so, I mean, this is a, 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 re- a reasonably new kind of terminology. I mean, it's been around for many, many years now, but what, what does it really mean? So what we, it describe imposter syndrome from your point of view. Imposter syndrome is like being in a room with people where you feel you don't belong, despite you having all the necessary uh, characteristics and requirements to be in that room, or being in a conversation where you feel that you're kind of over your head or you don't belong there, where actually your valuable in- your input is extremely valuable, you're needed in that conversation. So it's really mm-hmm. us doubting ourselves and our qualifications and our self-worth, making our own selves feel like we're not worthy when people who are also doing the certain activity that we're, we're kind of afraid of or participating in a conversation, look at us and, and have a really high worth for our contribution. So it's really doubting ourselves, uh, having some limiting beliefs, and questioning our own self-worth, which is preventing us from taking any action. Yeah. And I think that this, you know, we, I've done a lot of work with this with women with, with imposter mm. syndrome and it's, um, I think it's, it is definitely prevalent more so in women, but it, it affects everybody, right? We're all human beings. We all have these doubts. Um, and I think it's actually, you know, it's natural, but we have to, uh, you've got to get past that because if you don't get past it, you're never going to get, mm. you know, never going to break through that ceiling, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, you'll never accomplish anything that you could be equipped to do if you're continuing to question whether or not you should do it. So it's, it's holding it's, you back. It can hold you back. It's very debil- debilitating. Mm, okay. I guess we've got a few things there. My goodness, I've got quite a few things here. I've written loads of things down. So we've talked about, you know, the journaling, the future letter to yourself. You also talked about surrounding yourself with the right people. And it's one of the things I talk to my clients about. It's actually, you know, you need three, in my in my opinion, if you're running a business, you need three things. One is a peer group of people that you, um, you know, that you can learn from, that challenge you, that support you. The other one is a coach who can kind of keep you on track. I, I'm a big believer in that. I have one myself just be, to give my accountability. And the last thing I always say is an operating system for your business because that's what I help people actually implement. Um, but this whole community thing is really important, isn't it? Because the, as you said, the people that you surround yourself with, they that that's who you become. Um, how do you go about finding a peer group or a community that is right for you? That's a great question. I think there are different uh, techniques you can do. I highly recommend, you know, networking, going to 
places where they're going to be like-minded professionals or people there that you can share experiences with. And then you just have to talk to people. You can talk to people. You can see, okay, who's here that's really taking action, making things happen, and then there's less less talk and more action. I think that's one thing that we yep. get caught up with is a lot of people will talk about doing things, but very few people will do them. So you want to be part of the people who are taking action. You also maybe want to be around people who are maybe a step or two ahead of you. It's like they've kind of mm -hmm. already done what you plan to do and they're willing to kind of reach back and assist you. And maybe there could be something you could help them with. That way you can look upon them with for some inspiration and some guidance. Um, and then it just yep. takes time. And I, I really want to also reiterate that this can also be applied to your personal life too. There could be some okay. friends or significant others who are holding you back and are just not going to be good for you in the long run. And it just, that could be even more difficult conversation, but that also is very important when it comes to who you're surrounding yourself with. Because if, mm. you know, if the home life and in your personal life, they're not positive, they could be toxic or negative, it's going to hold you back professionally. So you really have to be diligent and focus mm. on who you have around you that's going to be supportive, inspiring, push you, but also be there for you, tell you the truth, maybe when you don't want to hear it. Um, and just continue to kind of be there for you. So networking, minding who you're around personally, um, yep. and then, you know, not being afraid to reach out to people and maybe have conversations with them and also be of service. Because once you're of mm -hmm. service and you're not just always taking, um, that will allow people to open up to you even more and it will help strengthen the relationship. Yeah, completely agree. I'm I'm a big um, fan of the Go Giver series um, of books. I don't know if you've read those by Bob Berg, but um, that that is all about you know it's all about how can I be of service, and that's how you create relationships. But I suppose people listening in are probably thinking this is easy for you and, and Deborah and Amani to say because you're you're natural. You know, you love to talk. It's easy for you to go out there and network and talk to people. What happens if you're a bit more sort of um, shy and nervous? And I think the first thing I want to say is that I actually I actually get nervous when I go networking. Mm -hmm. I I don't enjoy being in a room full of um, complete strangers. I don't naturally kind of go up and just talk to people, but um, I've learned how to do it. But if you're very naturally reserved, how would you recommend that they approach that? If you can find like maybe a buddy or a friend to attend some events with you, that will be tremendously helpful. I think that's the best yeah. advice I can give you is try to find, you know, a friend or a buddy in advance. If that's not possible, try to do a little bit of research before you go to an event. So maybe you can see, oh, there's two or three people that I definitely want to meet, find out about them so that when you're there, you can look mm -hmm. for them say, okay, well, I'm here. You know, I was doing some research. I'd love to meet Deborah because I have these questions for her. Is she here? And they'll say, oh, okay, well, let me introduce you. And they'll say, oh, why do you want to meet Deborah? Do that. I also talk to my students who are the same way. They're very, very uh, shy and just don't know how to network. And we do these yep. fun kind of icebreaker activities before each class each week. So if you have some, there's some fun questions about, you know, if I met you, Deborah, I say, okay, you know, what's the city in the world where you feel like best identifies with your personality? You know, just a fun question like that, just to kind of open it up, you know, and then I can yep. say, because for me, it would be Miami, Florida in the United States, because, you know, it's tropical, great music, very diverse. What about you? Yep. Something that's not about business, <laughs> fun. We can always talk about this. Even even more basic than that is to be like, OK, well, where are you from? Where did you grow up? You know, where are you from? And mm. many people move around and they say, oh, like if I'm using the United States, for example, oh, well, you know. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, but I grew up in DC and things like that. And that can say, oh, what did you like living there? Would you ever go back? And then from there, you're kind of off and running. And those are some two, well, th really three kind of tricks or techniques that I think are very effective, especially if you're a little bit more withdrawn and shy, that will help. And I think it's really important. I mean, I'm actually about to do a talk on networking this evening to a whole bunch of students at Auckland University, and I do it nice. every year just to kind of help them get out there. And I always say to them, it's like, you know, everybody kind of rushes up and immediately wants to start telling you what they do or their business. It's like, actually, let's be humans about this. You wouldn't do that to a complete stranger on the street. Let's actually get to know them as human beings. Ask them some questions that aren't about their their business. And I all and, and I love the your point about being of service. You know, I always go into a, a room when I'm networking, thinking about how can I help other people in here rather than what's in it for me? Because if you go into it with a what's in it for me, um, I think that rep that repels people. So yes. it's and, and also genuinely, I want to help people. So it makes right. it very easy yeah, um, to great. think about I'm going in here to help people rather than to network. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that's the that's the way to go. So I like it. 
Uh, and I love those questions that you've just given as well. I think it gives people a, a chance to, you know, just something that can break the ice. And, and lo- people do love to talk about themselves and that people also love to help. So, you know, yes. asking for help is, is good as well. Okay, um, we've covered quite a bit now. So we've got the journaling, we've got the future letter, we've got the community surrounding yourself with the right people. Um, is there any other sort of, you know, really key things that you would like to, to share around, you know, unlocking that creativity? Um, like, I think the key is just to take action, to try things out, mm. to, you like, about don't, that, get yeah. kinda, don't get kind of stuck doing nothing. Like, take action, try things out. There's really, you know, what they say, like, there's no such thing as, like, failure, only, you know, you know, only gifts, only lessons. That's an improv kind of philosophy. No mistakes, only gifts. So, you know, just try things out see what works, try something and doesn't work, shift, do something different, but don't just get stuck analyzing, looking around like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Move forward, try something, see what happens, build on that. I think that's the main thing is that many people, when they get stuck, they just stop and they don't know what to Mm. do. So they start to analyze, then they get paralyzed, do nothing. (laughs) (laughs) And if I can just encourage people, just try something. That's all. Yeah. I completely agree. I, I, I've got a, a very, very smart husband who's very, very different to me. And he's he often, I think, over analyzes and over complicates things. And he gets stuck in his head in terms of thinking about things. Whereas I'm quite the opposite. I'm just like, oh, let's just try something. And if it doesn't work, what's, I think my father always taught me like, what's the worst that can happen? Mm-hmm. And it's like, actually, yeah, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, really, gener- generally, not too much that can happen that is really, really bad. So uh, yeah, give things a try. Tapping into your childhood stuff. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at your screen. In your book, case behind you, you've got some kind of is it a white alien or something that's in there oh yes right there that's uh <laughs> yeah yeah this is a little stuffy this is a reddit the reddit kind of mascot is a few ah, the reddit of yeah, course it is reddit. yeah yes. ah. that's that's what it is so yeah <laughs> just to kind of keep it, so to me it, it just reminded me of like you know Reminded me of, of we, we tend to disconnect from our childhood because we kind of go, but we're, we're professional now. We've got to be serious. We've got to be in a professional. And um, I'm, I, I don't do that. I, I love my stuffed toys. Yes. I love having fun. I love taking myself back to the things I used to do when I was a kid. But um, we do tend to lose a lot of that as we get older. So how do you reconnect with your inner child? Mm. So reconnecting with the inner child, like many things – I like as a DJ, one of the most effective uh, f- techniques is to use like nostalgia and playing some songs or music that bring up memories of your childhood. Like you can see right there, I'm a big fan of like Mariah Carey and Mariah ah, Carey, yeah. a lot of her music got me through my childhood in addition, like Mary J. Blige. So if, if you want to mm-hmm. reconnect, play some songs that remind you of that time, watch some movies that remind you of the time period when you were a child, do things like that. In terms of um, journaling, you can also write about some things that happened to you in the past that, you know, maybe were very positive. It could be, you know, when you were a child. Um, Another activity in a specific journaling prompt that really is effective is that you write down, you describe your childhood room. Because for most of us, our childhood room was a place of sanctuary and safety for us. For most of us, sometimes not. But most mm-hmm. of us, you can remember the color of the room, as I'm close my eyes to remember, the posters mm-hmm. you had up, how the room was designed. Like for me, you know, I had my soccer and basketball trophies all around. I had a little stereo there that I would fall asleep to and my dad would get mad and come upstairs and turn it off and tell me to stop <laughs> playing music so loud. You know, I had my little Nintendo set outside the room. Just describe it. And it's yeah. something about the activity of this will really help to get you back to that time frame and really kind of have you remember the good things and then you can use that as like a to propel you into solving whatever issue you're going through or just making you feel better um Mm -hmm. and i think that specific (laughs) prompt is very effective because you know it's just most of it brings up good memories or you're laughing like "Ah, i was so silly you know even the phone i can remember the songs i used on the answering machine just specific things that really bring you back to time that make, make you smile and laugh and be like oh if i knew then what i knew now um, just things like that. Yeah. That's what I found to be uh, helpful, and also what my students um, have also found to be helpful. 
Yeah. You've actually got me giggling to myself now because <laughs> I've just imagined my room and I, I don't know if um, I'm a lot older than you, but we had this thing called Piero, which was a, a clown um, and it was all pink and white. My entire room, everything, the bedspread, the wallpaper, everything was Piero. It was uh, everything there. And I was, a, I was one of those children who just loved to read and where you got told off for having your music on, like I would be under the covers with a torch reading books because <laughs> it was past my bedtime, but I wanted to just get this chapter finished. And mm-hmm. yeah, it does. It, it immediately brings kind of a, a smile part of your face now I mean I, I appreciate not everybody has an amazing childhood but exactly. there's, there's yeah. always there's always points in your childhood that mm-hmm. will bring a little smile to your face about yeah. what yeah what makes yeah. you you mm-hmm. thank you oh, that's made my morning thank you <laughs> you're welcome my pleasure <laughs> <laughs> hey look you have been extraordinarily generous not only with your time but in sharing some of these tips and tools I really appreciate that um, I'd love now you know if people want to get in contact with you and they would like to perhaps book you as a DJ as a speaker um, to help unlock their creativity in their environment Environment. How do they best get hold of you, Amani? I think on the socials, it would be like at Amani Experience. So it's A like Apple, M like Mary, A like Apple, N like New Zealand, I like ice, yeah. experience, one word. Um, on the yep. socials, my website is amaniexperience.com. Uh, definitely reach out. I speak on three or four topics. I can MC. I do very well with uh, moderating panels. So email, socials, those are kind of LinkedIn, Amani Roberts. If you type in Amani, space robert space dj i'll pop up first on the list and just reach out i'll engage with you and that's the best way to have you know me either virtually or in person come and speak to your organization and or dj Oh, that is fantastic. Hey, look, thank you so much. If you're ever in New Zealand, please do look me up. I would love to catch up with you in person. Again, thank you for your time, for your generosity. Really appreciate it. Um, Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, Deborah. It was an enjoyable conversation. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.